you are watching Redicon. Inside the joint, longer biceps it has an extra and intraarticular portion. The intraarticular portion is very important and commonly showing pathology. Pathology it's usually originating from the superior labrum and goes almost horizontal and then make almost a 90 degree turn to the bicipital growth. We can see it in coronal, especially if there is little bit joint fusion. If we follow the superior labrum and make our way to the bicipital groove, in the axial, usually adjacent to the more superior cuts of the humeral head, and in the sagittal, we have to look carefully in the interval between the supraspinatus and subscapularis tendon. So what are the potential pathologies? Tendinopathy is fairly common. You can see the thickening of the uh, long head of biceps. As you see here, this is a coronal image. This is the superior labrum. This is as the supraspinatus term. I must say, uh, sorry, bicep, biceps tendon is uh, very challenging sometimes. And you have to look at, at the three sequences. In some patients, you can see the best in coronal. In some patients, you can see the best in sagittal. And in some patients, you can see it actually in the axial images. And the most important thing, you know your anatomy where it should be. The other uh, fairly common pathology is a dislocation of the, uh, of the long head of biceps outside the bicipital groove, and this almost always associated with subscapularis pathologies, because subscapularis usually give the sum of the fibers uh, to give the transverse fiber that stabilize the bicipital groove. So if there is a pathology within the uh, subscapularis, there might be associated instability of the bicipital tendon and usually is dislocated medially. As you see here, the bicipital growth is completely empty and the bicipital tendon actually is dislocated medially. One of the things I just want to touch base, it is the distance or interval between the humeral head and the coracoid. This is can result in what we call the subcoracoid impingement. And this is affect primarily the subscapularis tendon. So the distance between the coracoid and the humeral head, it should be at least 1.2 centimeter. If it's narrower than this, this potentially can impinge on the subscapularis tendon and can result in chronic tendinopathy and tear. You can see here, definitely it's narrowed with significant thickening of the tendon. This is what we call the subcoracoid impingement. Subacromial subdeltoid bursa, it is a large bursa extending from the inferior to the acromion and inferior to the deltoid muscle, and it does goes all the way laterally. So it can be present as an isolated pathology, as in here. You can see the tendon looks fine with normal morphology, normal signal, but there is a fluid within the bursa. So this is how the bursa looks like. Calcific tendinitis, you can see it as a low signal intensity, lower than the usual dark signal of the tendon within the tendon. It can be uh, without reactive changes or with reactive changes. I think. Uh, there is a, a good correlation uh, between the presence of reactive changes and patient symptoms. So here you can see there is actually calcific tendinitis with no much reactive changes. Uh, this is another patient with calcific tendinitis. However, he had a very large uh, uh, bursitis with significant reactive changes around it uh, so this is, and actually it is slightly migrating to the bursa, and I'm not going to go deep because we know that calcific tendinitis has the formative and resorptive phase, and usually actually it is more painful in the resorptive phase, and even the content of the calcium is different. Adhesive capsulitis, or what we uh, call it a frozen shoulder, generally frozen shoulder is a clinical diagnosis. We start to see more and more imaging finding of adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder as we are doing more and more MRI. So it is a condition characterized by thickening and contraction of the shoulder joint capsule and surrounding synovium. So how we are going to see it in MRI? Usually there is capsule thickening more than four millimeter. And actually I found this very common. 
So I don't depend only in the joint capsule thickening. I look carefully for the signal of the thickening. If there is edema with the thickening, this is where I start to call it frozen or adhesive capsulitis. Abnormal soft tissue thickening within the rotator cuff interval. This is a very important. It's like synovitis at the rotator cuff interval. Variable enhancement of the capsule and synovium whenever we give contrast, but usually we don't. So most of the cases we have to depend on these two findings, which is the thickening edematous capsule with synovitis or thickening at the rotator cuff interval. And I'm showing you an example of each one. So this is from the literature. You can see here there is significant thickening with edema at the inferior capsule, and there is thickening at the rotator cuff interval between the supraspinatus and subscapularis. This is a classical for adhesive capsulitis. Another case, you can see here there is thickening with edema at the inferior capsule, as well as there is edema at the rotator cuff interval. This is a classical for adhesive capsulitis. Just a point here of uh, very important point. This has to be, these findings, it has to be assessed in absence of history of trauma. If patient, patient had history of trauma, you're going to see commonly there is thickening of the capsule. So presence of the thickening of the capsule or edema does not mean adhesive capsulitis. So usually these are in a spontaneous shoulder uh, without any history of trauma. 